Hello, everybody. So nice to see you. For those of you who can turn on their cameras, we'd love to see your faces. Of course, we understand if you're unable to, you might be with a loved one right now. We know that. Um, I'm so pleased to be here with all of you. My name is Andrew Engel, and I lead virtual public programs at Reimagine. I live in New York City, also known as Lenape Hoking, the land of the Lenny Lenape peoples, past, present, and future. During the colonial era and in the early federal period, the US removed indigenous communities from this place, but also some remain among the continuing historical tribal communities of this region. I acknowledge the indigenous territory where I am to remind myself that more steps are needed to undo generations of damage caused by colonialism and white supremacy. Please let us know where all of you are zooming in from. We want to get that chat going. My pronouns are he, him. Uh, for those who may need a visual description, I am a white cisgender male with glasses, salt and pepper hair. Uh, I've got a bright orange wall behind me and some nice light is pouring in from the side. Today, my colleague Trina Williams is joining us and she'll be providing some assistance for this gathering. Thank you so much, Trina. Reimagine is a nonprofit organization catalyzing a uniquely powerful community, people of different backgrounds, different ages, races, uh, people of faith, people of no faith, all coming together to heal ourselves, our communities, and the world. We support each other in facing adversity, loss, and mortality, and we transform life's biggest challenges into meaningful action and growth. Reimagine resources, support groups, events like this series are free or sliding scale and accessible to the public. This is made possible by the support and generosity of participants like you. So for those who already made a tax deductible donation when you registered for today's program, thank you so much. Your gift will immediately support Reimagine's mission to help people of all walks of life transform the hard parts into purpose and action. And here's another pitch to offer support to our partners for this series at the Rosalind Carter Institute. Uh, you'll hear more about them soon. Um, Trina will be pasting some links in the chat. We've been exploring topics over a month long period. These themes have examined different aspects of loss, grief and struggle through the lens of post-traumatic growth, which is a body of psychological research that suggests we have the potential to transform and deepen as human beings after we experience suffering and emotional wounds. Now, another way of thinking about post-traumatic growth is through the great peace activist and Vietnamese uh, monk, Thich Nhat Hanh, who is quoted as saying, no mud, no lotus. We all have to struggle to bloom. Uh, last month, we dedicated the series to the power of writing, a vehicle to process grief and sorrow. And we touched on caregiving. Claire Bidwell-Smith and Marissa Renee Lee, both of whom are authors and grief experts, were our guest speakers. And both were young adults when they cared for their ill parents. They stressed how important it is to be compassionate with ourselves, to find support when you're experiencing loss, even when the person you're caring for is still alive. And often, it's difficult to connect with others who are navigating loss. This is why we're co-presenting this series on caregiving with RCI. This is why we offer our monthly facilitated drop-in session, Room for Grief. It's why we have monthly vigils to hold space for all that we've lost. So if you haven't yet, please register for the next two sessions of this series, uh, Cultivating Caregiving, and check out our other programs. Tomorrow, we've got one on Mother's Day. And before we begin, just a few Zoom tips. For those who wish, click on the CC icon at the bottom of your screen to get a live transcript of what's being said. 
and you can save the chat box by clicking on the three dots within that uh, window. If you have any, and if you have any technical issues, please contact me privately or contact Trina privately. We'll try to help you out. And I want to also announce that we are recording this session and you will all receive a playback of this video and anyone else who has registered for this event. Okay, our panel will begin shortly. It's my pleasure to hand this over in a few minutes to Porvi Bhatt, who will facilitate this conversation. A few years ago, our collaborators at Death Over Dim Sum organized a reimagined gathering by and for the Asian American community. Happy AAPI Heritage Month, by the way. Um, the focus of that conversation was caregiving and Porvi was a member in that audience. She found Reimagine. Her mother had died that year. She was deep in grief. And uh, I really connected with Porvi as soon as I heard her speak. I wanted to reach out to her one-on-one. -on -one. We had a call. Um, I wanted to find some way to collaborate with her. And then earlier this year, when I learned that she had joined the Rosalind Carter Institute as president and chief impact officer, uh, and I, meanwhile, was tasked with organizing a caregiver series, uh, this had to be our opportunity to join forces. Harvey has a stellar professional background as a public health researcher, as an executive, as a strategist, as a thought leader. She has worked across private, public, and nonprofit sectors of healthcare with particular attention to serving the needs of older adults, women, immigrants, people of color, people living with HIV, and other underrepresented communities. Harvey, I am grateful for your help in shaping this series and for the opportunity to get to know you better. We originally dedicated this series to the memory of Rosalind Carter, but I also want to dedicate it to Rekha and Harshad Bhatt, who raised a daughter with a strong moral compass. You can read a more detailed bio of Parvi and our other guest speakers, Reverend Cynthia Carter Periliot, Shaista Kazmi, and Vivian Nava Schellinger in our event description. Parvi, I'm handing this over to you and to our panelists. Oh, gosh, uh, Andy, thank you. Thank you, especially on behalf of my family to, to be able to be a part of this conversation it means the world. And um, and to be here together with Reverend Cynthia, with Shaista, with Vivian, and all of you is just uh, a very, very special space. So uh, thank you for what we're going to be creating together. Uh, on behalf of uh, Rosalind Carter uh, Institute for Caregivers and the Carter family and the legacy that we're shaping together with her in mind, um, this conversation is really rooted in a, an important quote that many of you may know at this point, I hope you know at this point, um, Mrs. Carter very, very astutely said many years ago that there are four kinds of people in the world. There are those who have been caregivers, those who will be caregivers, those who are currently caregivers, and those who will need caregivers. And sometimes when we talk about that quote, we say, oh, there are four types of caregivers. It's like, no, there are four types of people which is a really important distinction. Um, so I'm gonna introduce myself differently and thank you for the bio. Um, I am actually a former caregiver and a current griever. I am also a caregiver. I know that I will need caregiving. I'm an only child. Um, I, I am a second generation Indian American immigrant. Um, I had to, my dad's dementia began when I was 28 and he was 58. I'll be 58 this year. And my mother's uh, cancers began when I was three and she died of her fifth cancer two years ago when Andy and I initially met and I was searching. Um, and any one of you are likely searching and you may find yourself exactly where I am now uh, in a couple of years. And so I would love uh, in the chat, if you can identify who you are from a caregiver lens um, and let us know where you are. You could be multiples like I am, a former and one who's, who is getting ready to have someone take care of her. And as Mrs. Carter also said, caregiving is generational. So if, uh, if 
You had a grandmother who did it, a mom who did it, a dad who did it. You're likely going to be doing it and you likely will continue to be doing it. And she uh, jokingly even said as uh, she was getting older and as President Carter was going through his cancer diagnoses that here she is again, she's doing it. And so um, this brings us closer together when we are able to do this. So I'm gonna pass the introduction now from me to Reverend Cynthia and then uh, Shaista after her and Vivian after her. Thank you so much, Harvey, and thank you, Reimagine and the Rosalind Carter Institute for Caregiving. This is an amazing opportunity, and I'm so privileged to be here. And much like uh, we heard from our moderator, um, I am presently a caregiver. Um, I have the opportunity to be a supportive caregiver of my 92-year-old mom who lives in Ohio, the Columbus, Ohio area. Um, I joined the space of the work that I'm doing currently as uh, CEO and uh, co-founder of the AC Care Alliance as a result of being a caregiver for our dear father. Um, and as it relates to my future, um, of course, like probably all of us, I hope to live a, a long and healthy life, but I am fairly assured that I will need the support of someone uh, in the future as providing caregiving support for me. So it's an honor and a privilege to be here and to be a part of this panel. So thank you for that. And should I pass the baton on to the next person, Vivian? I think Saifa was going, but we can we can just roll with it. So thank you, Reverend <laughs> Cynthia. Um, Vivian Nava Schellinger, um, nice to meet all of you. Uh, thank you so much for um, having me. It's an honor to be here in a space of caregivers, care recipients, generational caregivers, grievers, um, joyous people as well. And we can talk a little bit about that. But thank you to the Ros thank you to the Rosalind Carter Institute and Reimagine. Thank you, Porvi, for your authenticity, uh, and to my fellow speakers. Uh, as I said, uh, when I introduced myself earlier, um, I, what I did not uh, mention is that I am a third generation Mexican American on both my mother and father's side. I self identify as a Latina, a Tejana, originally from Texas. My roots are indigenous, they are Spanish, they are French, they are the colonizer and the colonized, um, and acknowledging that is such a paradigm, but it's such an important and complex part of my identity. I know that this event is in honor of former First Lady uh, Ro Rosalind Carter and her experiences navigating being a caregiver and a care recipient. And although there are so many things that may make the both of us, both me and the former First Lady so different, there are shared experiences that I already know exist in this room that we are all in currently that bind us. And so I'm very, very happy to share today and I'm happy to be here. Shaista, over to you. Thank you. Hi Vivian. everyone. Yeah, it's so great to meet all of you and to learn from all of you. Um, I wanna thank you Parvi for bringing me on into this uh, field. We've had multiple conversations and to of course reimagine. Um, if I identify myself not only as a former caregiver to my father and mother-in-law, but also, um, you know, as a griever as well, when I lost my father and mother-in-law within a few months uh, time frame. Um, and I'm also a caregiver in waiting for my mom. Um, she's about 70 years old. She is healthy. However, based on what I'm seeing, I do believe I'll be a caregiver uh, to her relatively sooner than later. Um, I s identify myself as she and her, and I started my company or my caregiving journey with my father being diagnosed with multiple systemic atrophy in 2009. Same time, my mother-in-law came to live with me, and um, that's when my husband decided to do a fellowship and critical care and had three small kids and um, had nowhere to start on how to 
uh, start the process of caregiving in particular to this particular group, which was the South Asian community. Um, so I started my own company after going through multiple caregiving companies um, who were not able to meet the cultural demands of my parents. And I started my own company not knowing what I was doing, still don't know 10 years later, but here we are <laughs> thriving. Uh, and the main goal of the company is to allow our pay parents to age in place with dignity and respect. I will, um, this company is for profit, however, Families who do need care, we're willing to work with them because I know how financially difficult it is. Not only financially, emotionally, and physically demanding caregiving is. And that is what the platform that I want to promote and to speak out is allowing our parents to age in place with dignity and respect. And whatever our organization can do, we try to do. Thank you. Thank you, Shainstead. Um, one thing that is really um, impressive, and I'm just so proud that we're able to lift up, is this is one of the first, if not only, times that we're having a truly cultural and multicultural conversation about caregiving and the journey that we're on. And, and uh, you know, Shaisa, you just lifted it up. I think each of us in our own way have been lifting up the, the uniqueness of what happens when care needs to meet the mainstream. Yes. Um, and, uh, you know, I have a I'm going to kick off with that question. You know, whenever you enter someone's home, no matter what part of the world you're from, you're just definitionally in somebody else's culture. And so with that in mind, you know, what are some of the things that play out for us as care caregivers that are uniquely tied to culture? Um, Vivian, I'm going to start with you uh, because you did such a beautiful job connecting us all together and how we are together. But there are unique things that, that we need. And so how do our culture, belief, even down to food, and specific practices play out. Um, and then I'm just, we'll, we'll popcorn this one around and make sure we get each cultural view in. And again, in the chat, any thoughts about culture and how, and how it plays out in care? Absolutely, thank you so much. So I definitely introduced who I was um, and who I am in, in the first part of our conversation, um, but I also serve um, as the Director of Equity, Inclusion and Diversity and community impact with the SCAN Foundation out of California. And so although the work is extremely important, I wanted to make sure that I introduced myself first in this space so that you understood that who I am and the experiences that I bring, I apply to the work that I do and the stories that I tell. One thing um, to answer your question that I didn't mention as far as how I self-identify, and I, I guess it really is a part of my identity, is that I'm also an eldest daughter in a very self-aware, Latino community, uh, family, um, borderland people uh, kind of uh, upbringing. And um, I say that because that's such a, there's such a impact um, on identity and vice versa on the community when you are um, raised by what I say, um, my father, and also the Holy Trinity for me, which was my mother, my grandmother, and my auntie. And so, you know, when you really think about the way in which culture has influenced my caregiving experience, um, it's interesting because looking back on being a very young caregiver, um, much like the former first lady, see some of the similarities and the differences are so apparent to me. Um, I was a caregiver at 15 and didn't know it. And part of that is because that is how culturally we show love. And so I never knew I was caregiving. I just knew that my grandmother had moved in with us after caring for us for years and years and years. Um, uh, she suffered a stroke and she moved in with us. And immediately my mother became part of that sandwich generation of caregivers, had two young children at home, worked a full-time job, was a wife, daughter, all of it. Um, and I did it to help. I did it because that's how I show love. That's how you love, you know, grandma and the people that are, that are there um, in your home. And so I never actually, it wasn't until much later that I started to actually work, not just in aging, um, but in public health and health policy that I realized that I actually was a caregiver and I was dealing with all of the grieving or the, the, the issues, the challenges um, as a very young caregiver without really realizing it. So I would say that the part of 
uh, culture that I think needs to come into this conversation is that specifically for the Latino community, it's how we show love, it's how we show up, but it also prevents us from acknowledging that there is so much drain and there is so much burnout that contributes to that cultural value. Um, and it oftentimes uh, is supported by women. So it's very gendered as well. So, uh, you know, I think for me, it's just really the courage to think about it in that way and to really pull out the complexities of that experience, especially for the Latino community. Thank you for that. There are so many heads nodding on the the burnout and the expectations, uh, which in as much as culture is different, look at even that is uniting us uh, when we think about it. And so I'm wondering, Reverend Cynthia, from your lens, you know, what are some of the things that that are unique and different that butt up sometimes against the systems that are here to provide care? Yes, thank you so much for that question. And, and Vivian, I have to acknowledge the beautiful response that you shared in such a personal way. Uh, I have so many similarities in terms of uh, my ranking, if you will, within my family, uh, loving father and mother married 45 years before my father passed away. Uh, I am the fourth of five children, three older brothers, uh, the oldest girl, but next to the baby, have a younger sister. Uh, and as an African-American Christian woman, um, I grew up in the family that really believes in the power of prayer, that believes in the power of community, that believes in a holistic approach to life. And so that encompasses every aspect of life, eating well, exercise, uh, having a relationship with your creator, whatever that represents for you. For us, that represents God and, and the person of Jesus Christ and on and on. Uh, and so coming from that kind of background, when my dad was diagnosed with end-stage prostate cancer at his first visit to the doctor, uh, it was very challenging for us as a family. And frankly, the first time that we ever really had to, if you will, put our faith into action. Uh, and so our story is very interesting in that our experiences with the, uh, how should we say, Caucasian primarily led health systems was one where we felt frankly that we were not seen and that we were not heard. Uh, for example, I can recall um, when dad really did need hospice care uh, prior to a hospitalization and our family was around dad's bed. Uh, we had some church members are also with us in prayer and I can remember some of the reactions of the, the healthcare establishment in that hospital, I will never ever forget. Now, what you don't know about me is that uh, my undergraduate study is in marketing and training and education, <clears throat> excuse me. And what I saw uh, from that lens was an opportunity. Uh, it was very troubling that we, we weren't respected in that space where we were around Ed's bed in prayer. Um, and when we had conversations afterwards with some of the health professionals, uh, it didn't go the way you and I might hope it would go. Let's put it that way. Uh, and so I saw an opportunity. And so I put on my marketing hat that said, when it comes to culture, when it comes to people of color, when it comes to um, representation that may be different, if you will, that quote unquote different than the establishment, there needs to be some bridging of the gaps. There needs to be opportunities where, um, how should we say, the establishment has the opportunity to hear, to learn, and to find themselves as learners and not always persons that want to put upon individuals what a system might think is best for them. So all of that being said, um, 30 years later, I've been blessed to work with an, a team of incredible people, some of whom are on this, uh, on this virtual call. And we established an organization that really approaches caregiving, approaches persons needing care from a holistic perspective, mind, body, and spirit. And so what I did tell you about my story is that they diagnosed dad with eight months to live with metastasized prostate cancer. We're one of those stories that can say, my dad lived eight 
years, not eight months, eight years with metastasized prostate cancer and had wonderful quality of life and a very good ending. And so I think that story can resonate and it does resonate with individuals, not only from the African-American culture, but I find it resonates with people as a whole because when it's all said and done, we all are part of the human race. And that is embracing people simply by who they are and how they represent themselves. So I am just so appreciative of this conversation because I think it really gives us opportunity to tell our stories. And that's a big part of the work that we do. We train our care navigators to be good storytellers, but also majorly good story listeners and hearing what our participants, both caregivers and persons needing care have to say. So thank you. Oh my goodness, thank you. Uh, you know, I'm just connecting what Vivian was saying about the joy that also comes in this, just hearing about eight months translating to eight years because of uh, just the the beauty of the faith and and the, the healing that comes from paying attention to all sides of us is just really shining through what you're saying. And noting again, just as, as we try to get culture and mainstream health systems to come together, what, how tricky that can be. And so, Shaista, I'm going to come to you because you had to find a solution to that as best you could, noting some of the, the difficult times in that. So tell us a bit about that, how, why you needed to create it and what was, the, what was happening on the cultural side. So Cynthia's story just right now resonated so much that, you know, she was in that environment and she realized that there was a gap, there was some bridging that needed to happen. And same, that's the way I felt, because what happened was when I was thrown into this, um caregiving you know field it was you know at the same time my children were small and it was navigating so many different as a mother as a caregiver as a wife as a daughter-in-law as a daughter and my father was the head of the household and he had multi I mean he brought in multiple multiple people of our family from abroad and he was you know he handled everything. So when he became ill, things were starting to kind of go downhill at their home. And as my mother-in-law came, our family dynamics here at home, you know, was changing. And I contacted other organizations to ask for help. I asked, you know, insurance company, caseworkers, case managers, social workers, and they had no resources. There were no senior care companies in Michigan that served the needs of elderly ethnic minorities. For my mother-in-law, language was a huge issue because she could not speak English. She needed somebody who spoke Urdu. And it was very important for her, not only for her, but for us too, because once when she was at home and if I was at work, I would come home. And if it was not somebody who was culturally similar to her, I would have to co come home and redo the whole day. Um, not only with the cooking, but also just because most things would just not have been accomplished. Um, and at my parents' home, it was a cultural nuances that were more, you know, important and things that really needed to be catered to as opposed to language. To kind of find people from all these different areas where somebody spoke your language or somebody understood your culture was really difficult and there was no other resources um, when I contacted with one group, they were like, well, why don't you go to your local temple or a local mosque? And I was like, well, if I could do that, I mean, <laughs> then why am I contacting you? <laughs> and, you know, um, and at that time, I just was like, you know what? I can't be the only person in this situation. And if I am, then there'll be two clients that I'll have. But I'm like, I need to start an organization that will help our community, the community um, you know, our elderly seniors in our community, uh, whether whatever happens, at least I know that I really did my due part. Because as I've told everyone, our parents did a great job of building their temples or mosques or potato brothers, their Asian grocery stores. However, I'm not sure what the plan was of having to age. And because of this particular group, you know, the South Asian community, and that includes everyone from Middle East to, you know, the Philippines, it's a little patriarchal society in which a lot of the men did have a lot more say in how things were going to go. And I think once they became ill, you could see the cracks 
and you would have to, you know, as being the elder daughter and the daughter-in-law, there were so many different roles I had to play, but in order to kind of bring everything and pull everything together, I had to become transparent with my dad. And I was like, you need the care. Mom can't do it. Despite the fact she's 10 years younger than you, based on everything I had studied at that time, I knew as the primary caregiver, she was, you know, in part affecting her health. So that is definitely something that, you know, it was a challenge that I had to face a uphill battle with my dad of having to want caregiver caregivers in the home. Same with my mother-in-law. She's like, no, you're here. It's okay. And I would have to tell her, well, I can't be here all the time. Um, these cultural kind of issues mm -hmm. uh, were a challenge. Um, there will be challenges within our community. However, because now we're taking on our parents' care, I think it's a whole different situation as opposed to 10 years ago when I started this. 10 years. So that's amazing. I mean, I'll add just a little bit of nuance from, from my own story in that, um, and I was in healthcare, I was uh, deeply in healthcare <laughs> and the compartmentalization that was going on and what yeah. I was doing at, during an official meeting and what I was complaining about get while I was waiting for the official meeting was remarkable, right? So I think there's something to be said for how do we live an integrated life and make the decisions that need to be made. Um, you know, as South Asians, there's so many of us in the healthcare industry, yeah. Yeah. right? And so it is on us, but I'll, I'll, um, tell a little bit and then transition to the next uh, next series of questions. I'll remember, I remember when um, the hospice folks were coming home uh, to see what would happen next with my mom. And it came frequently, right? We were trying to make those decisions and they knew very little about our culture as well. Yeah. You take yeah. off the shoes, do the things, the food. And at one point um, I looked at them and I said, you know, when this time comes, when I'm when we're in this chapter, when it's down to end of life, it's not like we're in an Indian restaurant. And I'm going to help you through the menu. You yeah. have to know more about this than I do yeah. because you're here to help me through a spiritual and cultural menu that I have yet to see because as a second generation immigrant, it was happening in telegrams and, and airplane flights and very, very compressed ways. Right. So yeah. um, I can tell that you can relate to some of this. And so this is a very real, this was just two years ago. Right. So yeah. There's a lot of work ahead in trying to make a, a lot of this um, modernize. And we know going to scale really requires now uh, disaggregating so that we can aggregate to scale. And that's gonna take some time. So with that in mind- you know, Courtney, I, can I just comment on your, your beautiful on story? I really appreciate your, what you shared as it relates to just the, the significance of each cultural values and similarities as well as differences. I think it's okay to have the kind of conversation that we're having today. For example, it's an interesting thing that, that many times in our culture uh, as a nation, for example, when it comes to subjects like culture, race, um, gender, on and on and on, there's so much uncomfortability around these subjects. And I think that's so unfortunate because I think in our diversity, and it sounds cliche, there is power. I think the uniqueness of what we bring as whole individuals should be celebrated. And certainly we see that in the space as it relates to healthcare and dealing with challenges, chronic health, advanced illness, and even end of life. When we start thinking about our lives as a whole, who we are and how we represent really comes to through total, uh, I can't come up with the word right now, but certainly presents this picture that we don't have to be uncomfortable being honest with who we are. And I, I really appreciate this conversation because I think it brings all of that to bear. And when we're dealing with life's challenges that are health related and the roles that our family plays, let's face it, caregiving is intimate. Very. When the hospice organization came to our home, I'll be honest with you, wonderful team of nurses and CNAs and social workers, if you will. But I have to be honest and say, I was looking like, where are the Black people? Right? I mean, this is intimate. This is an intimate spot. And so having people that you feel comfortable with 
and that can connect with and gave my father the sense that he was really seen, heard and cared for. And my mom is a primary caregiver really makes a difference. So I'm not saying we didn't embrace and appreciate the Caucasian wonderful providers that came to our home. But my God, it certainly gives a sense of comfort knowing that there are people that understand the culture that you represent. Oh my God. And for us that is African American as well as believers. So I just wanted to put that forward. Caregiving is intimate work. It's very detailed and it's very personal. And very so nice. again, I celebrate the conversation that we're having today. Oh, and I really want to pull on a thread that you you're saying here as well. And then um you're opening up comfort in this conversation to just say the things that need to be said. So I'll say it, mine. When we use words like chaplain, that separates an entire group of folks as well, right? So whether it's from the hospital into the home, it's not that um, what it represents and the comfort that can be provided is very welcome, but even the language and the terminology can immediately make a group of people assume that that one's not for me. And part of the issue is that we've got to cross some borders on all sides, right? For that to improve, right? So that we are all together in it. And so one of the big questions that I have is, you know, I'm from the Midwest, so I'll say it, I'm from Minnesota. And uh, there's a lot of celebrating of the hot dish over the fence. Um, what the hot dish over the fence culture is, and I'll tell you right now, I don't see it every day anymore, is bringing over some leftovers, bringing over a meal, uh, to your neighbors, right? Just the cohesion of a neighborhood. And I jokingly say the only thing that brings a neighborhood together now is the HOA fee. But there's still this belief that we do this. So what do you, what have you seen um, in each of your respective areas beyond your own personal story, but in the work that you do, that is an innovative way of really starting to knit together the cohesion across the neighborhood, um, across the community? And I'll leave it open. Who wants to start that? I can, I can start there. Um, so, you know, I really, what, what brings to mind, whether it's the hot dish that's thrown out uh, 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 on the other side of the fence, but, you know, I really think about the currency of community and what that really means uh, for caregivers. Um, and at least in my own, I know you said, let's go beyond personal experience, but of course that's where I'm going to draw from first. Um, in my own personal experience, growing up like many of us in an intergenerational household, is I didn't even know, again, did not know that that's what I was growing up in. And now it's this phenomenon and people are talking about it and researching it and studying it and trying to decide how to market to it. And yet that's again, how we just showed up for each other. And so growing, growing up in a intergenerational household and understanding that there are various needs at play, there was always um, a community to come back to, even if that meant that in, that that's nuclear community that I had of my grandmother, my, my father, my mother, my little sister, um, that, that is what we, that's where we found our strength. That's where I found my strength without realizing it. I think more broadly though, um, oftentimes when you're put in a caregiving situation, at least what I observed, uh, about my mother at the time and now, uh, finding myself taking on virtual or long distance care needs for my own parents. Um, there's a fear that happens sometimes when somebody is put into a caregiving situation or a loved one is put into a caregiving situation. Uh, and the fear can sometimes come from your own family. And it doesn't, it may not mean that they don't want to be supportive or they don't want to uh, become that broader community for you to rely on but oftentimes there's just a fear of someone's own mortality. And I think we need to talk more about that. Um, there are so many things that can happen, as you said, Reverend Cynthia, caregiving is such an intimate experience. And so there are so many complex emotions that are involved. Um, and oftentimes people are just not given the time or the space to think about how they can be most supportive because they're dealing with their own feelings about mom or grandma or auntie or brother or sister. Um, falling ill. And so I think it's really thinking about giving people space for that and acknowledging that our experiences are really just um, 
collection of moments and 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 oftentimes you can't really go beyond what's happening in the here and now and so it makes it so difficult to grow that community oftentimes it becomes smaller and it's your care team mm -hmm. and for me our team was me my sister my father and my mother you know and so I would say um, be open to thinking about what your community or your care community what it can look like that's beautifully said. That's beautifully said. You know, I'm going to ask one last question because we really want to have the conversation open up to everyone else that's here. And uh, my last question is really around uh, anticipatory grief and burnout. Um, and if you were paying attention to my face, I choked up when Andy uh, dedicated this session to my parents. Um, they'd be proud yeah. that I did because they'd be the first to say, girl, you better not be forgetting already. And, uh, <laughs> and I haven't. But that is the through line of grief, right? And um, and it began well before they departed. So any thoughts, um, and we'll do very quickly across each of you. Shaisa, I'm gonna start with you, uh, but keep it very brief, but definitely reflect on anticipatory grief and, uh, and, and how we consider it. So I didn't realize that I was going through anticipatory grief. I had never heard of the statement as it's being you know, more thrown out there. But I remember my father was diagnosed with his condition in 2009. He passed away in 2018. I knew the trajectory of his disease based on all my, you know, the medical knowledge that I had. And I did not realize that what I was doing, when I would go to their house, I would cry. I would leave their house. I would cry. And then, I mean, this is like when he was first diagnosed in 2010. And I would just continually do this progress. And I was grieving for him while he was alive. And that I did not know what I was doing because there was nothing out there. Again, the resources were really limited. And I always was blaming it on hormones. <laughs> I was like, what's going on? <laughs> like, what is really happening to me? But now there is a term for it. For it. And now I tell my clients, especially when I'm talking to them, when I'm talking to you know, the aunties who are calling me and their husbands are, you know, in hospice and they'll be talking to me, I'll tell them, you know, it's completely normal to be going through what you are going doing. And I tell them, you know, they can either call me or a loved one or someone where they can express and share this. There's no shame in sharing emotion. And many times in our culture, it's like, let's sweep up things under the rug. That includes caregiving or mom and dad needs the help or I don't need the help or what have you. I think one of the things is that what I would like as a community as a whole to be transparent. Yes, there are, we have problems. There are some fractures within our community. However, I think one of the things and I have been a huge proponent of is that to share our grief, to share our journey. Um, we're all going through this journey, but I think collectively as a whole, as a community, we can definitely give ourselves a blueprint on how to navigate it. But again, like, as I said, I had no idea what the term was. I did not know what I was going through. And now, of course, I recognize it. So I'm able to share that information with others who are going through it. Thank you. Reverend Cynthia, any t anything to add? Well, there's a lot to add, but I know we're short on time, so I'll try to keep it short. But Anticipatory grief, I think, if I were to define it, it is the anticipation or the feeling of heaviness and burden that something bad is going to happen. I think that when we think about it from that context, the reality is probably everybody within the view of my screen is dealing with anticipating something, whether it is financial or physical or grieving the loss of of, uh, of a financial scenario, there is something that we grieve regularly about. I think the beauty of community, this is community, what's happening here today, the community that we establish amongst our families and loved ones and people that we choose to, to have in our life as support system really speaks to the, the importance of simply having people that you trust to walk alongside you and, and that's a big part of why we developed uh, and formed the AC Care Alliance. We are a community-based organization that hires and trains care navigators to walk alongside people as they're dealing with chronic serious and advanced illnesses. And let's face it, if you have a chronic illness, 
and it's not getting better. It's advancing to another stage. There's grief in that. And so just anticipating what could happen as you go down the trajectory path, you need people that can listen, that can care, and that can show love. Awesome. And so that's why we exist. Thank you. That is beautiful. Vivian, anything? Sure. Adding kind of what comes to mind when I think of anticipatory grief, I think of a, an extreme weight, just a weight that you feel. Um, you can define it as anxiety or you can define it as in other ways, but it is a weight that we likely in this room um, today have all felt and feel now and will continue to feel. And I think the 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 potential solve to that, um, the solve to that is really acknowledging that it's the small moments that begin to remove that weight, the focusing of the on the present, the not allowing yourself to go down the road five years or eight months or eight years or but focusing on kind of the present task at hand. Um, I think for whatever reason that does something, to break down that weight, to lessen it, um, to lessen the strain. I think, you know, relative to the work that I do and thinking about anticipatory grief and the work of trans transform more to transformative justice um, that I know community-based organizations are very much engaged in right now on various topics. Our foundation focuses on health equity um, in aging. Um, so specifically for older adults of color in California. And I know that, um, for me, one of the other solves institutionally or, or structurally is that philanthropy realizes that it's time to double down on funding initiatives that allow especially um, people of color or those from marginalized communities to find time for joy, for rest, for rejuvenation, for healing, um, for restoration. Um, because I know that, um, you know, women, men, all all non-binary people, I know what we're capable of when we work, but I just feel like the world will change if, you know, we can imagine the power of rest. Absolutely. When we rest, what's possible, especially for caregivers. Um, I'll um, wrap and turn this over to Andy with a final couple pieces here and just saying, you know, when just recently uh, in processing through some of my grief, I was thinking, gosh, how did I miss that this was going on for my parents when they were going through it? Um, and what I have come to on this is what an amazing time that we can even have this conversation, that we can be this open about a human experience that has always been here. This is the hope of what can come later, even in talking about rest from a professional lens is just remarkable, right? And so um, just very, very appreciative of the conversation that we've had. Um, I really want to turn it now over to all of you who are in the Zoom room with us with questions. So Andy, I'm going to turn it to you. Thank you, Parvi. Uh, and thank you, Vivian. Thank you, Shaista. Thank you, Reverend Cynthia. Um, I already see some questions already in the chat from GJ and from Tara. I will get to those. Keep on asking your questions in the chat. And I'm also delighted to ask all of you who do have questions, if you want to raise your hand, uh, you have the capacity to unmute. And we'd love to hear your question directly from you if you'd like to do that. So just let us know. Um, my question for all of you, this is a series about grief and growth. Um, for me, it's, it's, it's challenging from what I know from my personal experiences and from the experiences of others to talk about the growth associated with caregiving. This is hard work as a family caregiver. Um, but I do see, particularly in the examples of two entrepreneurs we have in our on our panel, particularly Shaisa and Reverend Cynthia, like I do see how your own personal struggles with caregiving gave birth to these amazing organizations that are providing service to others. I see that as growth. Um, are there other examples from your own personal experiences, and Parvi, feel free to chime in too, um, about when you might have experienced any moments of the growth when you were in the midst of the caregiving or shortly afterwards. Um, so I'd love to hear from you on that. I can jump in quickly and just, uh, and again, in the spirit of vulnerability, I didn't recognize cultural difference and owning it and fighting for it until, and that was my growth. My voice showed up in this, 
Um, I have been an ally for so many others because I am a public health professional in the HIV era many, many times. Uh, but I had to learn how to own my total self, as Reverend Cynthia is saying, and, and uh, speak up in a very, very different way. Um, and that is part of the growth. Um, the second piece, and I'll, I'll turn it to others, it is also just recognizing acceptance. So, you know, now that we've sized something called the care economy and it's turning into a much more professionalized space and movement, um, recently someone asked me about how to get mind share for caregivers. And I said, you know what, if I look back on this now, this is the growth for me. Uh, and I'm still doing it now. Um, I could have offloaded half of my tasks to an app to help me figure it out, but I also onloaded twice as much because I couldn't accept what was happening at home, which was my mother was dying. And I'm doing it now too. I'm not accepting, I'm still grieving, right? So there's something about just openly understanding what's happening and why, and noting that uh, many of you here are likely creating solutions and how to take what we're talking about as the first step of that solution versus assuming what it might be, because half of the time it's about something that we're not talking about, but need to, and then that'll be the big breakthrough. So that was mine, but let me turn it to others. Thank you for that, um, Purvi. And I, Andy, what an amazing concept, uh, grieving and growth in the same space. Um, I think you've really tapped into something powerful there. Um, when I reflect on my own personal experience, as I've shared with uh, our dad, my mom's husband, uh, the diagnosis, the extension of the diagnosis, Vivian, I think you said it earlier, and for me, it capsulizes uh, what this caregiving moment and conversation is all about. And frankly, that's love. Mm -hmm. uh, for me, love represents my relationship, keyword relationship uh, with the divine, and also, so that's the horizontal relationship. And it also represents my relationship horizontally with mankind and with all of humanity. And so for me, growth represents a deepening, uh, a depth, a continued search, a continued vulnerability uh, to the divine and also to my fellow human being. And so uh, for, for me and for my family and my colleagues, uh, the, the work that we are just privileged to be engaged in, uh, to walk alongside people that are dealing with their health challenges and seeing themselves as whole persons uh, and tapping into embracing culture and wholeness, whatever that represents for an individuality. People ask me often, uh, Cynthia, what is that spiritual cornerstone? Do I have to be a Muslim or Christian or Jew? to be a part of your program. And I say, absolutely not. We have agnostics and atheists that are in our program. The spiritual cornerstone means, who are you as a whole person? And how would you define that? And that's what we train our care navigators to embrace. So this grieving and growth in the same space, I think is profound because it gives us and in my personal case, it gives me the opportunity to allow the pain, the discomfort um, that I may process as a human being, the recognition that my fellow human being, no matter who they might be, might also experience that in a like manner. And I wanna do everything that I can to help them to process as I too am processing it in a very human way. Andy, can I comment on that question? So um, I really, I just want to say, I really love not just the question, but the title of this um, program. And it makes me so uh, grateful because as an avid gardener, um, you know, I do think oftentimes when I'm gardening uh, that there are so many lessons in life that are happening at the same time that my hands are in the soil or that I'm taking another chance on, on a new plant, a new species of cacti um being in Arizona um but you know I think about those terms grieving and growth and what that means and relative to our conversation and my gardening and touching the earth and feeling grounded and for me the growth has come from my experience as a caregiver has really come from laughter 
finding moments of actual humor and laughter in these intimate experiences that you oftentimes just share with you and you know your care recipient or even your caregiving team. And, and I find myself as I'm gardening, sometimes I do laugh because I realize that I'm planting the exact same plant in the exact same place that it died on me the first time. But there's some sort of hope that I have that something's going to be different this time. And I kind of end up laughing at myself, but I still do it. And there's, a, you know, the lack of the grief. It, it lessens the grief in the process of um, potential rejuvenation. But um, similar to, a, I'll just end really quickly, similar to a story, um, definitely the first time I've ever shared publicly. But um, during my grandmother's funeral, when she passed, my grandfather, her husband of 53 years, um, he uh, showed up to the funeral home and his pants were really loose. And no one kind of knew why grandpa's pants were loose. And so one of my cousins, um, one of my cousins, uh, Frankie, he went and he helped him out, took him to the bathroom, helped him out. Grandpa comes out of the bathroom. And of course, my very resourceful cousin, Frank, says, I took care of it. We're all good. I took care of it. So as grandpa walked up to the um, head of the, the, the front of the funeral home and uh, kneeled down to pray, we realized that cousin Frank had stapled his pants because mm -hmm. that was the easiest thing to do in the moment to rescue grandpa from uh, embarrassment. And, you know, to some, they may be outlandish. To some, that may be something you don't talk about. But for us, in the middle of a funeral of, you know, the matriarch of our family who would have laughed until she cried at that situation, it was the best moment of growth. So I do feel like there are these seeds of humor that need to exist. We need to acknowledge them. And we need to give ourselves permission that it's okay to laugh through your grief. Vivian, you worked in the, the gardening metaphor again, the seeds. Thank you. <laughs> and hat tip to you. I didn't properly acknowledge that our conversation about gardening did inspire yeah. the, the series. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> um, I want to get to some of these questions. I mentioned GJ and Tara. GJ, you had like three questions, but the one that I'd love to hear you articulate, if you're willing to unmute, is the one on social isolation mainly because we do have a series going on now at Reimagine on Loneliness. So if we could address that issue with caregivers, that would be great. Sure. Um, we often hear in research that caregivers feel alone in our experiences, but that data has never been broken down culturally. How does that resonate for your respective communities and personal experiences? I can jump in quickly. Um, it was a, it, it still is an issue. So social isolation, you know, I, the way I broke it down is just feeling it was fueled by misunderstanding and not understanding what we were going through. And if you're at least in our, in my case, I'm among some of the older second generation immigrants. So, you know, surrounded by people that are maybe also from India, but just more aligned to where my parents were, even if they were my age or younger. And so just couldn't understand. And then those that were a part of my tribe didn't understand the cultural part. So there's this kind of gray zone in the middle where you are on your own. And the isolation was fueled because the resilience allowed you to succeed on your own. And so when that's going on, it just keeps refueling. And then people believe that you're doing just fine. And and then they look at simple things like a bio that's read and think, well, look at all that. So she's great. And that isn't it at all. And, and so that the, the uniqueness of the cultural part is for me is tied to being an immigrant and being a, a child of an immigrant inside of a different demographic wave of immigration even. And all of that bundles together in, in ways that made it in, and continues to make it really challenging. Uh, because in my faith, in our traditions, my parents are gone now, crying about that isn't allowed. So mm -hmm. many things, like it, it's not even about moving on, is that it's not even about them being in a better place. This is just the the temporariness of who we are. But that also is isolating because that's not how it feels. 
such a great question, uh, GJ. And I loved your your chat about uh, about the heart moments that are those moments when the tears just kind of come out in anticipatory grief. So thank you for that too. I would jump in um, and thank you also for the question, GJ. Uh, I think inherent in uh, the 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 notion of various ethnicities, um, backgrounds, gender, uh, a different look, if you will, from the majority culture. Uh, inherent in those differences lies the notion of deep isolation. Um, and so for probably all of us, depending on how we identify ourselves, I think we can certainly identify with the fact that there are many moments of loneliness, uh, moments that people around me don't really understand me. Um, I think so inherent to being who we are as individuals, we also can very much relate to isolation. And then, of course, layer on top of the fact that we're you know, caregivers and that we're individuals dealing with health challenges, I think just, you know, exacerbates the, the, the concept of isolation. What we do in our organization uh, in one of our five cornerstones, again, with that holistic notion of care in mind, social needs is one of those cornerstones. Um, and under that umbrella, we really zero in on the need for socialization and the need for connection uh, with community and others. Um, and so a big part of that is connecting people that are engaged in our work uh, as participants, both caregivers and persons needing care through many times adult day centers or with a faith community or with an individual that might have a similar experience and the participant, the caregiver is willing to share their experiences. So it's a really important subject that you raise uh, this notion of isolation, it is a big issue. And we know that many times people grieve and many times that grief is deeply rooted in simply feeling totally alone and totally isolated. One thing that I would like to add is that I think as we get these stories out from different communities, different cultures, different religious backgrounds, I think having these stories come out will definitely help bridge that isolation, however, it won't completely, uh, you know, dissipate that isolation. One of the things that we had noticed within our own community was during COVID, when a lot of families were apart, having a caregiver that was culturally similar to our client helped ease that isolation. And as we came out of COVID, many of these family members were saying that if it was not for our organization, having, you know, these aunties who would be able to go into the home, make their certain dishes that these family members would want, it kind of um, took a lot of burden off of these remote caregivers who were unfortunately not able to travel due to COVID. But I think by having these stories come out that they're not alone, they're not alone in this processes, then I think that's something definitely that, you know, we can have more of these forums where people with different backgrounds can come and represent their communities and cultures to show that they're not completely alone. Thank you, Shaista. Um, we have a question from Tara. Tara, would you like to ask the question yourself, this is one on substance abuse. Sure, my name is Tara, my pronouns are she, they. And um, I basically was just explaining a little bit about my story. Um, I was a caregiver for my auntie with frontotemporal dementia and my dad um, with end-stage liver disease. And he passed away a couple of years ago. Um, but I think something often overlooked is the intersections of being BIPOC and socioeconomic status and that of substance abuse. Um, I found it really difficult in my caregiving journey to be able to speak openly and vulnerably about, you know, how his substance abuse contributed to the disease, you know, that he passed from. And it was just very stigmatized, not just from everyone, you know, outside society, but also even within my family, um, between caregiver, uh, um, sorry, medical providers, and even my family, there was a general sentiment of why are you caring for this person with substance abuse as though they don't deserve the care. 
And I think that um, was a huge barrier to me kind of speaking out and even seeking support. And um, I know that there are like AA programs, but I wondered if there was like a more caregiving centered, you know, about, you know, the medical diseases that they have in, in conjunction with the substance abuse and kind of that experience. So if this was all over the place, this is my first time kind of even talking about it publicly. So, so that being said, I'm thankful for this space. So thank you. Um, I just wanted to comment, Tara, on that. Um, more just a space and an acknowledgement of what you just talked about publicly. Um, I have someone in my family who definitely um, suffers from substance abuse, and we know that likely he will need care in his life, um, not too far down the line. And there is this, uh, I think there's this, there's this acknowledgement that un unraveling kind of the complex issues that that, that that kind of caregiving brings, um, you don't even know where to start. Do we start, do I start in the mental, on the mental health side of the issue, my own mental health as caregiver? Um, do I start with taking care of myself before taking care of his needs? I mean, there's so much to unravel there. And I do think that at least the one thing that I can offer is that the first step is talking about it. Um, whether it's with your family, with those that you know might be along the journey with you, is talking about it to the extent that you're comfortable, I think, today just doing that is a first step um, and it doesn't have to be a silent suffering of sorts. So I just wanted to say that. Thank you. I appreciate that. And I definitely also resonate a lot with what you and a few other people said about the patriarchal aspect of it. So you add that with the substance abuse and it's like you're expected to care give for this parent or this person. And even then you're kind of not recognized or appreciate for it because it's like, why are you even doing this? So it's kind of like a weird double whammy coming from yeah. both sides. But yeah. And I'll just, I'll just acknowledge the patriarchy uh, piece is that at least in the Latino community, I view, I view um, machismo as the like Latino cousin of patriarchy. Mm -hmm. And so absolutely acknowledging what you're saying. And if I could just jump in, and Tara, thank you for raising such an important topic uh, and weaving in this, this important concept around substance abuse and how that impacts uh, the service as a caregiver. But can I just ask how you are caring for yourself in the midst of you know, a very challenging scenario? Yeah, so I do have a therapist um, that I see regularly, which has been a Great. big help, I think the beauty of of panels or or meetings like this is fighting that isolation aspect because you really do feel alone like my therapist can support me as much as they can for me internally out but sometimes just having a community um really helps so thank you so much for sharing that i, I just I just know that what you shared is going to help so many people on this call. And as we continue to talk to the folks that we care for in our various communities, you know, you raise an important point. Many times we need professional support uh, as we navigate these challenging waters. So I just salute you uh, for sharing that and your transparency. Thank you. We have time for one more question here. And um I'd like to ask all of our speakers, um, what would you like the communities that you connect with that are part of you uh, to do to so that we can change, so that we can move forward? Parvi, you mentioned, for example, the fact that um, you're not gonna explain the Indian menu. Um, how do we get there? Well, um, so I'm gonna in in sharpening this one. So what what could the Indian community do differently so that we can make it easier to be a part of the mainstream? So that's that's how I'll answer this one. Um, and um, I think some of the things that we need to do is not only is to is to take a moment to try and integrate into the system as mm -hmm. hard as that may be, 
So, you know, I so appreciate what Shaista is doing, um, but I wonder when it's my turn, if I would, if I would choose that facility or if I would choose the one that's down the street and um, I don't know. And I think that part of the answer to that is whether, you know, the, the, the food that we receive from hospital to home includes ours now. Um, you know, I had 30 frozen oatmeal meals because Medicare Advantage that was sending food home had nothing for my family. Mm -hmm. And I was too overwhelmed to even figure that out. And in the end, it was just too much, right? And you can get a frozen Indian meal on an airplane flight from here to India if you want it. So it, someone's making it at scale, mm -hmm. freezing it and getting it somewhere. So those kinds of connections to make make those hardware connections happen um, and I said, I love your thing about if I had time to go to the temple, I wouldn't need, you yeah. know, I've said that a million times, but now it's time, especially me as in the, in the former chapter that I'm in is to make the time to go to temple and help them come to hospital and to be ready for these times with hospice The meeting folks halfway, um, I think is important. It, it's got to go both ways. Shaista, for you, how about some actionable steps so that we can move forward? I think one of the things is, and that's what you know, I loved about being a part of this panel was just the open dialogue and having a conversation. I think one of the things within my community is they don't want to talk about what's happening in their home due to whatever cultural issues there may be. For me, I was very transparent. I mean, I even told my husband, like before I started this, I will be telling our story. I will be telling our story of our what ha you know how things were managed in our household, taking care of his mom as well as with my dad's, uh, and my mom was completely on board as well. I have always been a proponent proponent of explaining and telling people so that my voice can then kind of help carry along our community's voice. Um, not talking about things or you know not not saying that there are issues and that there are some things that we need to directly talk about and solve. I think then there's no you know that's not the way to go. I think having certain issues, having problems, coming to um, a place where we can solve these issues as a community, but then also as a whole um, in um, the country that we're living in to get different resources to help us manage and help us uh, grow and thrive as a community. But I think definitely having an open dialogue within ourselves, within the, you know, wherever we're residing and um, all around, uh, hospitals, uh, assisted livings, nursing homes, um, government agencies, bringing these things on, just like Barbie was saying that, you know, when I try to approach Meals on Wheels, um, because I was like, most of my clientele will not want to be having, you know, uh, mac and cheese are going to want their dolls and their rice. Um, and they had no idea. So I think by having these conversations, letting our different organizations within our communities know that this is our community, these are kind of what the things that they need in order to allow them to age in place with dignity and respect, I think that we can definitely um, move our communities forward. Thank you. Vivian, reflections on Latinx communities. Yes, I would say one action step and one thing I would say to my community and uh, would ask of it is when it comes to caregiving issues in the entire, you know, continuum of care is to honor the fact that rest is doing something. Um, that took me a long time to, to understand. And I think even my mother now in her 70s uh, is just coming around to understanding that that rest is actually doing something and that you have permission to do it. You can give yourself permission, whether it's five minutes, five hours, five days, whatever it is that you can do, rest is doing something. So to the Latinx community, please start lifting up that as a cultural principle that we can acknowledge. Because I think right now, and the way I was raised, productivity is what determines how good of a person you are your level of productivity, your output, um, your work ethic, grinding, hustling, you know, all these terms that we then take into the um, professional uh, world that we participate in. And I think the larger action step there is learn from that 
and ensure that workplace policies and policies around supports for employees um, take that into consideration, that REST is also doing something. Thank you, Vivian. And final mm -hmm. reflections from Reverend Cynthia. Thank you. I, I absolutely mirror everything my fellow panelists have shared. Uh, ditto, ditto, ditto. <laughs> uh, I would simply add that uh, an actionable step for um, our communities, particularly communities of color, um, I would challenge people to begin to consider trust. Consider that there are trusted resources, that there are trusted individuals that will share their story and give you the opportunity then to see that there is a meeting point, that there is a point that you can relate to one another and therefore have a sense that you are absolutely seen and absolutely heard. I think there's something so important about the meeting of the mind and the heart uh, in these challenging spaces uh, around caregiving and knowing that there are others that have been in your shoes that are currently in your shoes and that you're not alone. So I would challenge people to be courageous and practice finding individuals that have similar stories that you can trust. Thank you all. Thank you so much for this insightful, compassionate, conversation on caregiving. And thank you all for showing up. Thank you for your questions. Um, I also want to give a shout out to two special guests in our midst, uh, two speakers from the next two sessions of our series, Cultivating Caregiving. Next Wednesday, please register for Jessica Guthrie's workshop. Uh, hello, Jessica. Um, you're gonna be in for a real treat with this workshop. So please join Jessica and Tony Miles from RCI. Um, also, we have Neil Shaw, um, who is here. He'll be in conversation with Jessica McGlory, two amazing millennial entrepreneurial caregivers. Um, so um, Harvey will be there as well. Uh, and we have Richard Louie, as our moderator, you may know him from MSNBC and, and NBC um, as a journalist, as a news anchor, he's an author, he's a filmmaker. Um, so I hope to see you all there. Um, Trina, thank you for pasting the link in the chat. Um, we're a bit past time. Thank you for sticking around and I hope to see you all next Wednesday. Take good care, everyone.